Good evening and welcome. This is the second in a series of events on uh, an eight-day journey called the Pilgrimage of Transformation. My name's Robbie Apovich. I'm with the Charlottesville Clergy Collective. And because this event is sponsored by the Clergy Collective, as well as the city of Charlottesville's Office of Human Rights and the Kluge Ruh Museum, we're going to begin with prayer. This is one of the things clergy and the native peoples do very well. It's traditional among Monacan and many other native people to offer a welcome and a prayer. So that's what I'm going to do in our language, and then I'm going to tell you what I said. Higun ekia sabahentiwa yimikas masi tangui tans nain habay nekewa ayingwa kasik henenu yesa mankiko ha yuka ni yota heoma eni kawaya konspewa yaknamsai ika amai in Yoma, Napaski Ayin, Ika Amai, Konspewa Gadaya. So, what I'm doing is asking the Creator and our ancestors to bring our hearts together in a good way. Um, in English, I say if you have something troubling, you can leave it outside the door and pick it up on the way out if you want, or you can just leave it there. But we like to bring our hearts together in the most peaceful possible way, and I want to welcome you to our homeland, because even people who have lived here for generations are still new from our perspective, and we are not new. <laughs> We've been here a really long time. So I'm going to give the mic back to Rabia, and then I'll come up and do my talk. And I have to apologize because we don't have our dancers and drummers here tonight. And the reason is they're young people and their parents said, on a school night, you can't come out. So I'm not in charge of that. Anyway, um, I, I am here in my most spectacular outfit and I will do my best to entertain you. <laughs> All right, and I neglected to say, of course, that's Karen Wood, who you're, you came to hear tonight. But before we go further, okay. <laughs> I'll give you a little um, housekeeping and background. Uh, you see we are using this door on the left. There are restrooms in the lobby. There will be snacks in the lobby afterwards. You're welcome to have, but don't bring them back in here. And I think that was most of my housekeeping, right? Okay, I'm gonna tell you just a little bit about the Charlottesville Clergy Collective. It is an interfaith group founded by Reverend Alvin Edwards, and it is designed to have the faith communities work together to address the divisions of race. We conceived of this particular week, we call the Pilgrimage of Transformation, that has, uh, I believe it's six different events. We walked from Charlottesville to Monticello on Saturday, and today, with it being what most calendars call Columbus Day, we thought, how could we not recognize indigenous people on this day? I'm sure uh, Karen will be much more eloquent, but uh, the thought that somebody discovered this land is slightly ridiculous, so <laughs> we, we were pretty clear about that. But the intent of the pilgrimage is to awaken people to history that is little known, our history, and our histories of uh, Europeans coming to this continent include some very dark sides, and they are the dark sides of the treatment of the African population who became enslaved as soon as they came over here. It's 400 years of oppression. And of course, the treatment of indigenous people that was earlier than that, and it was moving people and 
than not giving them full rights. So we want uh, our citizens to know this and not to know it from a place of guilt or shame, but to know it from the place that it may be time to do something about it. So see what calls to you, what calls to your heart, as we are here together with our hearts, to say that it is uh, time to recognize the unity of humanity rather than the differences, and to honor them. Okay, it's a little longer than I thought I'd go. Um, Thursday night, just to let you know, we have another evening, and it's called The Christian Empire, The Trauma of Doctrine, The Doctrine of Discovery. It's at Mount Zion First African Baptist Church, and everybody is welcome. We have a Friday event, which is sold out, so I'm gonna tell you about the Saturday event, which is a bus trip from Charlottesville to Jamestown and then Fort Monroe. Um, some of those stories we've heard are that the, the first uh, ship bringing enslaved Africans came to Jamestown, but it didn't, it came to Fort Monroe. So after we named our pilgrim in Charlottesville to Jamestown, we decided we had to go a little further. Um, and that will, we have two very meaningful events. It's a long day and you can learn about it on uh, seaville2jtown.org. Dot com. Dot com. Dot com. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> um, Pastor Bates, no, not another prayer. I hope we can't have too many prayers. One prayer is enough, he says. One prayer is enough. All right. And I'm going to tell you just a little bit about Karen Wood. She's an enrolled member of the Monacan Indian Nation. Uh, and she directs the Virginia Indian Program at Virginia Humanities. She has a Master's of Fine Arts in Poetry and a PhD in Linguistic Anthropology. And you're going to learn a little bit about her poetry, and there will be some books of hers poetry books for sale in the lobby afterwards, if you're interested. She has worked at the National Museum of the American Indian as a researcher, and at the Association of American Indian Affairs as a rep repatriation specialist. And in 2015, she was honored as one of Virginia's women <laughs> in history. Um, so with that, I'm going to see if any of our co-sponsors want to add a word. Charlene, they're here somewhere. Do you want to speak at the end? Do you want to say something now? Okay, I really do. You can see the office, the Charlottesville City Office of Human Rights as a co-sponsor, as is the Kluge or the Kluge Root Museum. Okay, and with that, let's hear from Karen. I'm going to start out by talking about my outfit. I'm wearing my traditional regalia. Um, everything that I have on has meaning, and a lot of it was made by me. But a few of the things I bought, like this, because I can't do that by myself, right? So a lady in Oklahoma made it. But the colors, the yellow, the red, the white, the black, are the essential colors of Suan people, and that is our language. And so they represent not only the cycles of a person's life, but the seasons, and uh, everything is in a circle when we think about our lives. So what's interesting about Western culture is it's linear. You know, we start at this place and we think that we're progressing to another place. But we don't always define what progress is. And Native people think of life as circular. And you continue to fulfill your roles as a family member, as a person who's connected to the earth and other beings. And the thing that has struck me most profoundly recently as a person who teaches students is that we teach our students how to think for themselves in blocks, departmental silos, like psychology and mathematics and stuff like that. We don't teach them how to be balanced human beings or how to respect other forms of life. And this is the one thing I really want to impart 
to everybody, not just younger people, but the idea that we say we are all related and we mean it. You know, it, it's not just something to say. We are connected to all the forms of life and it's not okay to just um, compartmentalize things into resources to be extracted from the earth. And we're getting into trouble because we have thought in that way for a long time. So anyway, what I'm going to do now is talk about a very long history in a really condensed period of time. So this will be like Reader's Digest version of Virginia Indian history. And it's important to think about 18,000 years. You know, John Smith showed up at like 11.50 p.m. If we put that on a clock, you know, it's such a short period of time if you think about how long Native people have been here. So, <coughs> sorry. so what archaeologists know about Native people is that we have been here for 18,000 years. When I was in school, we were taught it was 10 to 12,000 years. Native people came across the Bering Straits wearing fur coats and chasing mammoths and wielding spears and all that. We have no archaeological evidence for any of that. So what we know now is that people have been here for a whole lot longer. Right here, close to Richmond, 45 miles away, they found evidence of you know, 18,000 years of artifacts. And so now scientists don't know how long people have been here or where they came from or how they got here, which I think is very fascinating if you happen to be an archeologist, which I am not. Um, but it, it's, it's a time when people are really questioning what we've been taught in the past. And if you ask native people how long we've been here, they will typically say we've been here forever or we've been here so long it doesn't matter. So time immemorial, you know. Um, we can't put a date on it. We have our stories. There are people among the Hopi who remember a time when the sun rose in the west. Okay, that sounds really weird. But that means there's been a long period of occupation. And if you talk to some scientists, they will say there have been meteorites that changed the way the sun rose. I don't know. You know, I'm not that person. They also talk about legends, we say, of giant bears and beavers and bison. And we know that evidence of those creatures have been found right here in Virginia. So they're not legends and myths, you know? We call them stories, but it's really a history that nobody has bothered to corroborate. If you look at, and because I'm a linguist, this matters, if you look at the linguistic diversity among Native people in the Western Hemisphere, we can point to at least 40,000 years of occupation because there are that many complex languages and that many diversities of sound change among different languages, just like we don't talk like Shakespeare or Chaucer. You know, things change over time. So here are some of the creatures that those pre-contact people would have encountered. My favorite is the saber-toothed cat, who I interpret his Latin name as Smilodon Fatalis. <laughs> right? You want to encounter this guy in the dark alley? Not really. Then we have the short-faced bear, and here he is as a skeleton standing next to a normal-sized woman. We have an American lion. I didn't know we had lions here. We have a dire wolf. And what makes him dire is that he weighs about 200 pounds. <coughs> Right? So I have a dog that weighs 60 pounds. He's enough to yank me down the road. I don't want a 200-pound dog or a wolf. And here's the mastodon that our people were supposed to have been hunting. And I would suggest that if there was anything else to hunt, you might not choose this one. <laughs> 
So what we know about Virginia is that it was really cold back in those days, that people lived in family-oriented bands, that they followed the game, maybe the Mastodons, maybe not, that we have evidence of uh, Clovis technology here on the left in every county in Virginia, as we call it now. So already at the 10 to 12,000 year point, we know that people were in every county. So that's not true. And then we have evidence of the Thunderbird site where different groups of people visited for more than 2,000 years to make uh, different points in order to um, hunt the animals that they were pursuing. I'm going really fast. Then as things progress, we have a climate that gets warmer and drier and those really big mammals go away. And we can see that their points are getting smaller, like there on the right, because they're hunting smaller animals like deer and elk. And we still have those in Virginia. We have evidence of sites like Dory's Cave, where people were uh, living and archaeologists like Jeff right back there can see what they were eating and how they were spending their time. So we're able to look at these things 9,800 years ago. Then we see in the middle archaic period that people are changing the tools that they're using. Like this guy on the right is using an atlatl, which is an Aztec word for basically a spear thrower that enables you to throw your spear farther and more accurately than you did before. So people are getting really smart about what they can do with their tools. And we get to this late archaic period, we know that there are tens of thousands of family-related people living on the floodplains, that they're nurturing different plant species and gathering them like sunflowers, right? Sunflowers are really nutritious. They're also developing a soapstone technology. And if you go to a place like uh, Rock Creek Park in DC, you can see that people were developing that technology there. So it was a really important place way before it ever became the capital of the United States. And we know that Native people had relationships with domestic dogs. We don't know how old that is, but it might go back to the point where we might have called ourselves human we are so closely intertwined with dogs, it's a symbiotic relationship that works for both species. So then we get to this early woodland period. People are making pottery. And what they're doing is impressing the pottery with different types of fabrics. So archaeologists are able to look at the patterns and figure out at what point they were making them, and which cultures were doing it, and where they came from. So it's very interesting um, if you're into that kind of stuff, which I'm not really. <laughs> but but I, I think it's kind of, I, I, just, I just don't know. I'm not one of those people who can like walk through a field and find uh, points or pottery shards, you know. I, I think it's interesting, but it's just not what I do. So we get to this point where we have populations that are diversifying culturally, and we have burial cultures, and people have time to venerate their ancestors. So they're burying their ancestors in different ways, and celebrating in spiritual ways the lives of those people who came before them. I think it's really important that we note those ancestors <coughs> were part of the communities of the living people and stayed with us. We didn't leave them behind, you know? And one of the most important things that happened during this period is the introduction of northern flint corn. Now, corn developed in Mexico and Central America. And if you look at the edible part of a corn plant, it was about that long. So it's like corn from Chinese food. And over time, people uh, developed it and bred corn that was more nutritious and more capable of being grown in different places. 
And finally, they came out with some corn that was able to be grown in our colder climate. And what it did was transform native life, because now we had food surplus. And guess who's in charge of the food surplus? The people who grow it, and that would be the women. So they had some political power, which I don't know if they had it before, but they certainly didn't have it in Europe. So Native women had more voice in the society than European women at that time. And people were trading different products back and forth and having gatherings. And sometimes anthropologists like to think that we were all isolated cultures and we never talked to each other. Nah. You know, we had guys who could run from here to New Jersey in three days. You know, even without horses, there was transportation, there was communication, people were exchanging information and products all the time. So now we get to the point where we're more familiar with, because this is when the Europeans show up and start writing things down, and they're living in towns and villages. And now we all call them villages, even though there were some cities, actually, and towns that were larger than those in Europe at that time. We have lots of different kinds of artistic and ceremonial practices. We're adding the beans and the squash to the corn, and this is a, another kind of symbiotic relationship we call the Three Sisters, because the beans put the nitrogen into the soil, which helps the corn to grow. The corn stalks grow up and provide a frame for the squash, which also makes uh, the bed less weed weedy. You know, they, they cut the weeds out because they cover up the ground. So this is a pretty cool thing. By the time John Smith and his friends show up, this is the cultural configuration that we have. We have different language groups, including Iroquois speakers, Cherokee, basically in the Southwest and in the Central South Virginia. We have uh, Monacan and other Siouan speaking people in the Central Piedmont. And we have the Palatine and other Algonquian speakers to the East, what we call the Central Plain. And if you look at that, that allies very neatly with Interstate 95. <laughs> And there's a reason. It's the fall line. This is the point at which the land drops off. And you can't bring a big ship up past the fall line. So this is where all of the big towns, Fredericksburg, Washington, Richmond, developed. But it's also the demarcation zone between what was called the Monacan and Confederated Tribes and the Palatine and Confederated Tribes. They knew all this stuff. And then we have the Shenandoah Valley, which is a very different kind of place geographically because the rivers don't go east to west. There are mountains on both sides. So you have this valley in the middle, and it makes a very nice travel corridor. So the Iroquois people would come down from New York and chase uh, into South Carolina, pursuing the Catawba. And they said they had to be able to do this because the Catawba men had called them a bunch of women. And they couldn't tolerate that. Right? So this is all true. What we have is uh, semi-permanent communities. So people would build houses that look something like that. I think those are actually mats from the Philippines and not ones that they made. Um, it's a lot easier to just import them. But they would go to their areas where the animals and fish were, where they could hunt and, and fish, and they would leave their houses and their fields until uh, they came back with the meat that they needed. And we had matrilineal and matrilocal societies. That means you know who the mother is. She's in charge of your clan and decides who you might be able to marry if you know, you might choose someone who's <coughs> of your clan and too close, that's not cool. So she has a say. She also gets to decide who goes to war and when, because it's her children who are being put at risk. So these clan mothers had a lot of societal power. Matrilocal means 
if you're a guy, you marry into your wife's family and you go live with them. And her relatives raise your kids. So there's no domestic violence in a society where her brothers are watching out for you and what you're doing, right? So, and also it means that if you aren't a good provider, you might come home one day and find all your stuff sitting outside the house. <laughs> and then you know you just got divorced. And, and guess what? You got to go back and live with your mom. So, so I think there's a lot of protection for women in a society like that. It also means that there was not a lot of privacy because everybody was living in these big long houses and you weren't by yourselves very much. So it might have affected romance, I don't know. Um, in any event, we have these guys who show up, 104 men and boys, uh, who come in 1607 and sometimes Native tribes did not have sustained contact until after 1700 because it took them a while to make their way across the country. Um, and they were always looking for gold and stuff like that. And Native people didn't quite get that. So here they are, they show up, they don't negotiate with the local leader, they just build their fort and they lie to the Indians and say, we're just waiting until we can fix our ship. And that wasn't true. Um, Newport comes upriver and supposedly discovers Richmond. And every time they discovered something, they claimed it for their king, which was the doctrine of discovery. So which you guys are going to talk about. Um, and really, the Christian church had a lot of effect on Native people. The doctrine of discovery claimed that people who weren't Christian could not own their land. They just occupied it. And so only Christian princes could own the land. And every time they showed up, that's why they would plant a cross and discover it. And then the native people were subject to what they would decide to do with them. Uh, after a while, things didn't go so well between the English and the Indians. I think mainly because each civilization thought the other one was barbaric. You know, they didn't get how these people were acting, and so they were always questioning what was going on. And things didn't go so well for the English for a while, but eventually they did recover. They started spreading throughout the whole coastal plain, taking up the good farmland and bringing their livestock. So there was a problem here because pigs tend to run all over the place if you don't pen them up. And the native people were always complaining that the pigs were eating their corn and stuff like that. And in addition, often the livestock carried diseases that the native people had no immunity to. So we talk about the influence of smallpox for you know, English people on Native people, but we often don't understand that it was the animals that they weren't used to that were bringing these diseases to them that caused sometimes as much as 90% of a population to die out. So if you can imagine 90% of Charlottesville suddenly getting a plague and dying, wouldn't you think that whatever face you had was not working for you, you know? And you would try to figure out how to survive and, and where to go. And that's what happened with lots and lots of tribes. So when I teach to, uh, you know, students, I think it's important to ask, you know, what do we know about history and, and what, how do we tell it? And when I was in school, there was like a series of facts and things that great men did. And now what I imagine is that there are different ways to interpret that story. And we need to think about what's important and why, and who has the archival uh, responsibility for um, discerning what matters. And often what's important and why isn't really that important to me, I don't know. Um, 
But I have to ask the question, you know, is, is history a science or an art? Every time you tell a story, you decide what to include and what to leave out. So um, I'm deciding what's important every time I, I say, you know, even when I'm doing this presentation. <laughs> so the idea is that we have this history that begins with Columbus. And today, we could call it Columbus Day, or we could call it Indigenous Peoples Day. You know, Columbus didn't discover anything except for himself and his people, because they didn't know about it. But there were lots of people who already knew about this hemisphere and the fact that people lived here and had their own spirituality and their own ways of being and living in the world. And even Columbus said the people in the Caribbean were the most generous and loving people that he'd ever met. And so it would be a great idea to enslave them. You know? Yeah. So people like me who have fancy degrees use big words to say uh, terms that everybody else knows, which is basically semantic marginalization is a way of using words to make some people less than others. So we say that Native people had villages and not towns or cities. We say they did gardening. They didn't do any kind of agricultural science. They didn't know anything about astronomy. I'm like, please, you know, when the native people attacked, it was a massacre and, and not a battle. And they had the legends and myths, and they had survival skills and lore, which is a funny word because I think only other people who have lore are Boy Scouts. You know, like, I, I don't know who else has lore. Who even uses that word? Um, they didn't have art until pretty recently. And we delineate between prehistory and history. History is what happens after the colonists show up and start writing things down. Prehistory is what happens when the native people told their stories for thousands and thousands of years and corroborated it. And if you told it wrong, the elders would correct you because that's how we transmitted all of our laws, all of our ways of being, all of our religion, you know, we had stories. It wasn't about how Rabbit lost his tail and stuff like that so much. I mean, there might have been, but it was how to be in the world. So, so these are important things. When we see museums in America, very often they are small museums owned by historical societies or dedicated volunteers who really want to tell the story of their place, but they don't have any money, and a lot of the exhibits are not well developed. So we see things like collections of arrowheads that some guy collected on his farm, or stuff in glass cases that doesn't necessarily have any tribal affiliation, or tell us about what time those things were made, there's no um, understanding of the objects. And often later, when we involve the descendants of these tribes, they say, oh, that was made by, by my grandma, and here's the story that goes with it. You know, so it helps to have some kind of discussion. We have policies that have really hurt Native people. We have Native schools that were developed to assimilate American Indian kids, sometimes by force. So they were removed from their families without the family's permission. And here's like a picture of all the kids at Carlisle School at the bottom here. There was a school in Hampton that educated a bunch of Native people, but not Native people from Virginia. So the people from Virginia, if they wanted to go to high school, they had to go out to Oklahoma. And the idea was to separate you from your culture and your language so you weren't doing that stuff anymore, that savage stuff, and make you into a, a less than version of a white person, you know, a person who could serve. We have a guy, this guy, who is like the Virginia version of Hitler, 
he uh, was the director of the Bureau of Vital Statistics for a very long time. He had the idea that we shouldn't allow races to mix. And if we did that, then it was going to pollute the intelligence of the white race. And so he and his friends passed this Virginia Racial Integrity Act in 1924, which prohibited people of color from marrying white folks. And if you did that, it was a felony. And the funny part about it, which isn't really funny, is that there was an exception made called the Pocahontas exception among people I know that said, if you were one drop black, you couldn't marry a white person. But if you were less than 1 16th American Indian, you could. And that was because so many legislators in Virginia claimed to be related to Pocahontas. <laughs> right? So, yeah, there we go. But he was, he was obsessed with making sure that people didn't inter, intermix. And they published a book called Mongrel Virginians, which was all about my people, the Mongolian people, in which they, the people who did the research said, because we were a mixed race, we were mentally defective and morally inferior. And my name is on one of the lists that this guy wrote, and saying, don't let these people pass into the white race. So I have to acknowledge this is part of my history as well. Finally, after Nazi Germany started imp uh, implementing some of its procedures, people started thinking, maybe it's not so cool to let people decide what is a superior human, and maybe this is not a real science. So they finally kind of worked it out that they weren't going to do that anymore, but not until 1967. <coughs> so we have to also think about how popular media has impacted our images of American Indians. And I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, everybody went to see the Westerns, and there were images like this poor Indian who was like falling off his horse. And these guys, who, if, if you ask anybody, any American, about an American Indian, they'll say, Sitting Bull or Crazy Horse, or somebody from the past who was seen as an obstacle, who was always fighting the cavalry, right? And the cavalry is always chasing them across the plains while they wear their full headdresses, which you don't do when you're running away from the cavalry. Um, Bill knows. Yeah. So we have all of these stereotypes. We have people who think every Indian is getting rich because they all have a casino or a smoke shop, right? We have uh, people who think that Indians sit around uh, rubbing rocks and taking care of the earth and, and being like wisdom keepers, Lord, peace, my son, you know, stuff like that. We have uh, Pocahontas falling in love with a blonde Ken doll who was nothing like John Smith did in his time, and neither does she. She was 11. And we have these uh, kits where you can buy Indian toy sets some of which have like um, canyons, at the same time they have teepees and birch bark canoes and you know, guys in headdresses and all these different cultures that are melded together because nobody knows what they're doing or just picking stuff that's cute. And then we have my favorite since Halloween is coming up, the polka hotness outfit. Um, <laughs> I mean, really, look at her shoes. What, what Indian woman would wear shoes like that? Um, and her outfit and her headdress, which only men wear, right? I have to make this funny because it makes me so angry. <laughs> so luckily, things have changed in our society. You know, we have the civil rights movement, thank God. We had the women's movement, we had American Indian movements, we had the public schools that were integrated in 1963, which I would like to point out was nine years after Brown versus Board of Education, 
with all of his speed, it took them nine years to get us into public schools. And even then, the bus drivers wouldn't pick our kids up. You know, there was that much prejudice going on. We had the American Indian uh, Religious Freedom Act in 1978, which finally made it legal after a hundred years for American Indians to practice their religions. So, in a country founded on freedom of religion. We had uh, the NAGPRA, Native American Grace Protection and Repatriation Act, which made it uh, required for institutions giving federal funds to consult with Native people about the disposition of human remains and objects of cultural patrimony. So, up until then, people could study what our stuff whenever they wanted. And then in 2004, we had the National Museum of the American Indian open, which for the first time presented Native history from a community-centered perspective. So up until then, it was people deciding what mattered about our societies. So hold on a second. Okay, so Vanta Loria Jr. was one of the premier scholars of Native people. And he published this critique where he said, you guys show up, you anthropologists and other people, and you study us and then you go away and use what you've done for your own benefit. It doesn't bring any benefit to us. So why don't you talk about how you could work with us instead of objectively studying our communities. <clears throat> and because of that, anthropology and other disciplines decided that they really needed to consult with the descendants of the communities they were studying, instead of treating them like human guinea pigs. And I think that was a phenomenal shift. So you have to have respectful partnerships, and some of us know, it has been very beneficial to us and to the scientists to work together. So this is a big deal. <laughs> Things have really shifted. <coughs> what we know now, I mean, we have uh, our history, we have our homelands, we're still here. We have 11 state-recognized tribes. We have seven federally recognized tribes. So, It's been a real shift. Um, we aren't even really sure what to do with it yet. <laughs> um, tribal leaders that get together with members of the governor's office and that partner with universities like Virginia Tech and hopefully the University of Virginia soon. <laughs> We're working on it. So these are the uh, 11 state-recognized tribes and where they're located. You can see that most of them are east of Interstate 95, and Monacan is over there by itself, and it's a terrible map of Virginia. <laughs> but there are many different tribes. These are all uh, mostly, I'm sorry, Algonquian-speaking people, and then Nottaway and Cherenhaka are Iroquois-speaking people. So we can talk about what are the major issues of federal recognition for a few tribes who still don't have it, and what to do with it once they get it, because they still have to figure all that out. Um, people who are still coming after tribal lands, for example, uh, the Newport News Reservoir Project, some 15 years ago, they wanted to take water out of the Mattapanai and Pamunkey Rivers and use it for a fresh water source instead of building a desalination plant. And so they were going to suck it all out of the rivers. And guess what the Indians want? When does that happen? Right? So I'm going to skip through these because that was all about the uh, protest out in South Dakota. 
But I think what's really important for my purposes is to tell stories that haven't been told. We were never asked to speak before. You know, my ancestors didn't get to tell their stories. So before I come out and do a presentation like this, I ask them to stand on my shoulders and guide me because their voices are important. Their perspectives, are, you know, are, have been invisible. And so now we're able, through programs like the one that I operate, um, to help people um, explain the stories that they have. And recently in Seville Weekly, we had a huge feature story with a big portrait of this elder named Branch on the cover. And he is so proud. Every time he sees me, he's like, I just love you. I'm like, I didn't even write this story. <laughs> I was just there. You know, but we have developed new resources. We have changed the standards of learning, which we found out were all written in the past tense. So it was Indians lived in such and such a house. This is what they wore. This is what they ate. And kids got the impression that we had died, right? Or that there were no women among Indians because the only stories they heard about were guys. Like I walked into a classroom and this kid goes, it's a girl, the Indian is a girl. <laughs> oh my God, you know. Because what, what would he have seen, you know, all about men, right? Sacagawea and Pocahontas, that was it. You know, and they were both helpful. I was like, let's see some Indian women who weren't so helpful. <laughs> yeah, but I have a digital archive that we're building and I'm so excited because we have like 300 and some images, different photographs and things from the past and I had an intern over the summer who managed to help me add 200 more images and build new exhibits about Virginia Indian archaeology. So every you know, every era is now represented and people can learn from all over the world what happened to us. So, that's it. And I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, I can take some questions if you have some. Yes, ma'am. I have not. Yes. That's what we're getting to commemorate, yeah. There's going to be a huge. No. Well, the oh, I'm sorry, do you want me to repeat the question? <laughs> My question was, if, if the 1607 Jamestown ship was just men and boys, when did the first women came? She said it was 1619, which stunned me. And I was a history major. Well, they were doing other things before the English women arrived. Hanging out with Pocahontas, I guess. <laughs> well, people say no. so, I don't know. I'm, I'm kidding being quite facetious. It might, it might be true. She got kidnapped. Yeah, I don't know. Thank you. Um, I had a question about the term American Indian versus Native American because I was always taught to say Native American because you know they weren't really Indians. Um, but I noticed you've been using the term Indian. So, what you know? What's the reason? Why have you accepted that term? Okay, we had decided that Virginia Indian was an appropriate term because there's a whole body of land called Indian Country and there's Indian law, and even if Columbus termed us inappropriately. Native American could apply to anyone who was born here, you know, so neither one is correct. <laughs> you know, the, the best thing is to call someone by their tribal name, but some of them we don't know and we can't pronounce, so we'll just stick with Virginia Indians. <coughs> Hello. 
Um, I'm visiting from Massachusetts, and I'm actually looking into Native peoples in Western Massachusetts, the Mohican and all the rest, just in terms of being linked to African Americans and enslavement. And so I was just wondering, since you would mention the corridor up from New York, what if there's still any connection that happens between the Iroquois in New York coming all the way down? How So that's kind of my question. Since we're since the Mohawk Trail actually runs through my town, so I was just interested okay. to see the connection if there was. Yeah, one. there was a there was a, there was a further historic connection where Tudelo people from Virginia went up and lived with the Iroquois people uh, in New York and ended up in um, Six Nations in Canada. So those connections have continued. But I don't know very much about Western Massachusetts. Yeah. I was going to ask, since you're a uh, linguistics too, if you could say something about the different um, languages, at least in Virginia, and how they differ, and if that has any connection in your, your mind to different culture, a different way of thinking about things. Well, the Algonquian language um, is a huge language family that begins in Canada with Métis people, uh, the Ojibwa, and goes all the way through Maine and down through New England to Virginia. I'm not even sure if it goes further south than that. Um, the Iroquois language, there are pockets of speakers in New York and Western Virginia, and all down through Georgia, with the Cherokee and so on, and um, also through Central Virginia. And then the Siouan speakers who kind of go through the Piedmont in the Southeast. So each of those language families is distinct, and within each group there are dialects. So it's very complicated. How many languages? Oh my gosh, do you know? 500 or something. It's a huge number of distinct languages, and some of them are isolates, so they weren't related to you know, other language families, but then the families are like, you know, French, Portuguese, you know, um, Spanish. They're not mutually intelligible, but they're related. Um, I have a question, I apologize. It's about Western uh, Native Americans, uh -huh. Western Indians. I lived in New Mexico for a while, and I have developed this idea, which may be completely false, that one of the things that was different about the Spanish occupation of lands is that, in general, at least in New Mexico and Arizona, they did not move the, the, the people away from their tribal lands. And so there is a lot of continuity existing there. Um, which makes for a lot of modern day differences between, I think, what Indians, Native Americans in that part of the country feel about their heritage. Is that a true fact, or is that just something that, that, that the Spanish occupiers of that land were really interested in getting gold and going back home, not in developing the land and moving people off the land? Right, I think there's some truth to that. Um, there were some Spaniards who got evicted in the early 1600s by Pueblo people. Um, Pope in particular was the leader. But my understanding is the Spaniards were um, physically cruel to native people, but didn't tend to intermarry as much. Um, but they did enslave them. And their whole idea was to missionize the native population, to build these missions and to bring the populations under their dominion in that way. So, yeah, but, but I, you're right, there are a lot of uh, Native people who have retained their languages um, and a lot of their cultural practices in New Mexico and other places in the Southwest. And my favorite story was I went out to one of the Pueblos and they said they buried the priest in the church and the water table is really low. 
So when it, it would rain a lot, his coffin would come rising up out of the floor and everyone would proclaim a miracle. I just thought that was funny. I don't know. <laughs> yes. Thank you for being here. Um, I was hoping you could talk about, well, um, I think our society could benefit greatly from, from uh, more influence uh, of Native wisdom. But at the same time, like me as a, as a white person, I don't want to be a cultural vampire. So if you could talk about that balance, how to achieve that balance. Okay. <laughs> how long do you want me to talk? <laughs> no, I, th I think there's, there's a lot uh, of truth to that. Um, there are ways to appropriate culture and there are ways to respect it. You know, and I think the way to respect it is to ask people uh, what they would like to offer you in the way of knowledge and stuff like that. And the way to appropriate it is to assume that you have the right to practice their religion or wear their some fake headdresses at Coachella or their Pocahontas outfits and stuff like that. You know, but, but I think there are lots of people who are really interested in, in Native culture, and, and I don't disregard that, you know. Um, I just think we need to stay away from the stereotypes and try to really learn about each other, you know. I mean, we would do that with any culture. You don't just put on a kimono and claim like you know what being Japanese is about. Okay. So it's the same idea. We have a couple of questions here, and then we'll go back. Okay. Um, I was wondering, um, at your attire tonight, I, I suspect that, that each color has a special special meaning. And um, is that common to one tribe, or, or is it a... Right, well, we sort of ascribe to a, a Siouan belief, and the white is the north, um, the east is the yellow, the red is... Um, you know, summer and you know that kind of stuff and then the the, the west is black and, and that's like the last phase of life so we're, we're moving around this circle um, and then the feathers matter too because those are sacred they're eagle feathers and then I have all these colors on me that you know just kind of represent um, that cycle and the rose is a very personal thing because I had cancer twice um, and this is my way of representing the idea that life still blooms, you know, and, and we, can, we can look forward to the next season as long as we're still here. No, we, no, nobody comes with a guarantee, you know, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for your presentation, it meant a lot. Um, how about the numbers pre-Columbus, uh, when there are millions of natives here prior to his arrival? I've heard so many different estimates, you know. A hundred million, you think? Yeah. Is that the whole Western Hemisphere? Okay. That probably is right, yeah. Lots and lots. And, and there are people, I mean, like, uh, Bartolome de las Casas, who was with Columbus, who said, you know, 50 million people were wiped out in 50 years, you know. And, and that was through violence more than disease. So, so just the violence itself was horrific. And we don't talk about genocide in this country, but, but that's what it was. Yeah. He said there were methods of torture that had never been seen before. You know, so when we talk about Columbus Day, I have a, a pretty visceral reaction. You know. Yeah. Um, I would really like to thank you for being here and doing this presentation. Aww. But I also have a question. Could you tell us more about infamous Native American leaders? Can I tell you more about famous Native American leaders? Infamous. Infamous. Who aren't famous? Like, who we don't know. Oh. Who haven't been in our history books. So. Okay, that's a great question. Wow. 
Well, there were people like Sasha Kolesky who signed a treaty as the queen of the Powhatan people. She was a, a woman, you know, we could have women chiefs as well as men. And she spoke for all of the other tribes at that time. So there are people like that. There are people like uh, Nancy Ward, who was considered a beloved woman of the Cherokee and a real leader. There are uh, many guys who were not violent, like Sequoia, who invented a way of writing down the Cherokee language. So there's lots of different people that we often don't talk about. But that's a great question. Thank you. My favorite is Wil Wil Wilma Man Mankiller. Oh, yeah, Wilma Mankiller, the chief principal Cherokee. chief of the Cherokee Nation. Very close. Yeah, and they have a population that's as big as, what, the state of Rhode Island or something. And then she passed away. So, yeah. I'm a Skokie Creek. Oh, okay, cool. Well, I'm glad you're here. Good to be here. Awesome. Question right here. Hey, Fred. Thank you, Karen, very much. My question is not nearly as interesting as it is, but probably as important. And you alluded to the University of Virginia. I wonder if you could speak to what you would like to see the university do that it's not doing now. The university does not have any tenured Native American faculty members. It doesn't have an institutionalized program for a minor concentration in Native studies. It doesn't have a plan for putting those courses together in a, a method that would be beneficial to students. And we've had a number of students who have done surveys in the past 15 years that I've been talking to administrators who have said, you know, 80% of them got no real contact with native course contact content in their education in high school or in college, and they would like to have it. So I don't understand why the administration wouldn't want to bring all these uh, ideas together and help students understand this perspective that they're not currently getting. It seems to me like a no-brainer. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for asking. Yep. Come back, Joe. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for doing this again. And I was wondering, I've heard a lot a few years ago about the Sacagawea statue and it having a problematic representation of Native women. So, and I know they put a plaque in, and I haven't heard as much since then. So do you personally think that um, for you the plaque was enough and seeing that change was enough? Or would you like there to be more development um, addressing of that issue. That's a good question, too. I was actually part of that plaque uh, installation because what happened was a friend of mine who is here tonight um, brought some descendants of Sacagawea to Charlottesville and they stayed at my house. Um, the problem is you have to walk across the road to see it and who's going to stop and look at it, you know, in the middle of the road. Sacagawea, or Sakakawea, depending on which tribe it is, um, is crouching behind Lewis and Clark when, in my opinion, she should be pointing the way, mm. you know? And mm. sitting. Mm. So, so the same guy who uh, paid for Lee and Jackson also paid for Lewis and Clark and George Rogers Clark. And these, in my opinion, are all ways of sort of invoking a, a white supremacist view of history, you know, rather than saying um, there are different people who participated in our story. George Rogers Clark has, has got a gun, and some of his guys are wielding a powder keg at, at Native family. I'm like, it's the most violent statue in Charlottesville, and it's right on grounds, you know. And people just walk by it. And I was very embarrassed one time, very recently, because we brought some folks from uh, North Dakota to visit here, and we put them up in a hotel that was right close to that statue. And I thought, oh, this is terrible, 
you know, these are, are their folks, you know. So, so who wants to see that? That's like, you know, let's have a statue of the lynching out by Ivy Road, you know. Let's get real here. Or, you know, or do something where we at least explain the viewpoint of folks at that time and say, we're not those people anymore, you know. Hi, I had a question um, about the Carlisle School and other schools like it. I grew up in Pennsylvania, know a little bit about the Carlisle School, uh -huh. but from what I understand, it's still tightly controlled by the military or army. I think you need special security clearance to even go there. And so I was wondering um, what access Native peoples have to those spaces currently, and whether there's other schools that are being for different purposes and what you and other um, people would like to see with those spaces. There are still federal Indian boarding schools, but my understanding is they are not run the way that they used to be. Um, I thought Carlisle was closed. Is that it's on the grounds of the U.S. War College. Do people have access to it? Because there aren't students there, right? Military, okay, but not native students. People do go there to the cemetery and, and put wreaths on the graves of the kids who died there. Okay. Okay, so. You can go there, but, but there's, there's, no, there's no more student body place. Question right we were here. talking about Sacagawea a little while ago, and uh, I'm on the board of the Lewis and Clark Exploratory Center, and when there was a vote, the uh, York and Sacagawea both given a vote. That vote was just as important as other men on his launch. That's good. Just start. And how about the dog? <laughs> I think the dog is pretty cool. <laughs> I think we'll take uh, a couple of more questions. Who had their hand up over here? I just had a question um, about, the, about the Monacan uh, people um, and what sort of work uh, is being done in terms of, uh, I don't know, preserving is the right word to say it, but I would say it, preserving the language as well as the oral traditions um, of uh, the Monacans in their history. Okay. Um, there are no Virginia Indian languages that are spoken today. But we do have a grammar and a dictionary, so we could, with some grants, begin to rebuild a lexicon if we had a linguist to do that. So at this point, um, we haven't really begun that work. And the work that I was doing is really about what does it mean if you can't speak your ancestral language for your identity as a Native person? What if you can't talk to your ancestors in prayer or uh, think about the geography that surrounds you in your own words, and what does it mean for your value system? Because English is very different than native languages. It's, it's very focused on what I'm thinking and the abstractions of thought, whereas native languages are about what I'm doing. And I say, you know, love is an action word. You can't say, I love you in our language and say, uh, my heart feels good, you know? So, so how, is, how is that different, you know, if you can't describe yourself and your belief systems in the words that your ancestors would have used? And then from there, what do our people want to do with the language? Do they want to pray? A lot of them do, you know? Or do they want to be able to say, hey, how are you doing? You know, some of the kids, want to have like a little code language they can use at school and stuff like that. But um, ultimately that will probably be up to the next generation because I don't know that I'm up to it. <laughs> <laughs>
Hey Karen, I just um, imagine that a lot of us are wondering how we can learn more about um, well, what we can do, but also how we can learn more. Um, and so I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about how people can learn more about the Monica Nation, maybe a little bit about the Gallon Okay. People. Okay, well, um, there are books. There is a book by Sam Cook called Monitors and Miners. There's a book that Jeff Hammond just wrote. She's going to be selling right outside here, like newly published called Monitor Millennium that really details the history. Uh, there's a website for the Monitor Indian Nation. Um, there are lots of different resources that people can look at. Yeah, thanks. Sure. We also wanted to make sure you had time to read some poetry. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I so I'm, that. I'm going to encourage, just sort of for the format, we're going to hear some of Karen's poetry. Um, we'll, we'll do a small closing and then you'll be in the lobby for people to ask more questions. If do you, you want me to read now? Or? Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay. That so, would be wonderful. So I brought my first book, which is called Markings on the Earth. My second book is called Weaving the Boundary, but I'm running out of copies. So I wanted to read a couple of poems from here. Um, and this book is really more about Monacan identity and the things that, that I've been working through um, in order to figure out who I was. So it was, it was very strange there for a while, but. I think the, the best thing about it is talking to other Native people and Native writers and, and kind of figuring out where you are. So this one is called Celebrating Corn, and it's been published in a lot of places, including the National Museum of the American Indian Cookbook, because, because corn is so important to us. It's like the mother plant. <coughs> Pounding the pestle against a white stone, she grinds last year's kernels to meal. I've planted my corn. A thin white gold powder clings to her hands. Around her air shimmers. I've planted it with my song. One of the puppies is barking, staccato yap yap, punctuating her strokes. Let it grow tall and beautiful. Beside her in ant stitches, shell beads to deer skin, as young women lean toward clay pots, stirring embers. Washed in sunlight, the men are out gathering red clay for ochre. Beyond domed bark houses, fields watered by rains, stretch small earthen mounds toward the river. Red buds blossom, their branches upturned like hands. Grandmother, we plant our seeds. She pats meal into ash cakes. Already night falls as a smell of bread rises. Painted, the men drum their song, celebrating corn. So um, I'll read one more here. And, and this one has a connection to Jeff Hampton because it refers to a story that happened near Fredericksburg, but is now Fredericksburg, where uh, Captain John Smith and some of his men came sailing up the river, Rappahannock, to see if they could find some gold. And our people shot arrows at them, and this one guy got left behind because he was wounded. And we ended up writing a historic marker for that place. And instead of saying Captain John Smith encounters Amarola, it was Amarolic encounters John Smith. <laughs> you know, and I think this is important for how we tell the history. So it's called Amarolic's Words, and there's an epigraph that says, you can't take a man's words. They are his, even as the land is taken away where another man builds his house. And that's from Linda Hogan. He must have been a sight, Captain John Smith, as your dugout approached with Jamestown's men, sporting plumed hats, poofnickers, beards, stockings, funny little shoes. He might have looked to us, well, 
uncivilized. We fought you, we know, because you were the down. One man was left behind, wounded at your mercy. Among your shining goods, mirrors, knives, firearms, glass beads, where was mercy? Maybe you left it in England. Eager to learn Captain Smith, you asked about the worlds he knew, whether there was gold, why his people had fought when you came to them in love. He told you in his dialect, which no one now speaks. You recorded his name, his words, not his fate. Of all the words our people spoke in the year of your Lord, 1608, only his answer remains. We heard that you were a people come from under the world to take our world from us. <laughs>